Uh, is this your image of Nordic or Scandinavian people? Or maybe it's the people like this. What we're going to do is talk about uh, the Viking economy. How do the socialist or Nordic states compare to the US? Uh, and the Nordic countries, by the way, are, are uh, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. The primary source for this is a book by George Lakey uh, entitled Viking Economics. Lakey teaches at Swarthmore College and has written extensively on social change. His wife is from Norway and he lived in Norway for several years. I was able to meet George Lakey the other evening via a Zoom meeting and that was a pleasure. The Nordic population, the Nordic countries have a combined population of about 27 million compared to 22 million for Florida. And please note that Iceland only has 343,000 people. The population is scattered across a large area with mountains, fjords, thousands of lakes, huge forests, much, and much of the population is at or close to sea level. There's darkness for half the year. Norway and Finland border Russia. So while the big cities look like this with the gleaming skylines of Stockholm and Oslo, um, much of the region looks like this. There is also a long history of poverty in all of the Nordic countries and they faced Nazi occupation, communism, tremendous financial and natural challenges. But the countries created visions for what they wanted for society and for their economies. Some of us in the US might call that socialism. <laughs> socialism, the term strikes fear in Americans. We hear politicians and pundits call the Nordic countries socialist nanny states. The term socialism conjures up dictatorships and totalitarian government control. We were on a, weeks, uh, on a walk several weeks ago and a neighbor commented about the toilet paper crisis in the US. She said, that's what would happen in a socialist country. She was hinting that under socialism, the government runs everything. Markets are bare and there's no competition. Another friend told me this week how he can't vote for Trump again because Trump doesn't have a heart. But he's not excited about the alternative because of socialism. He fears we'll lose freedom and says capitalism, reward, capitalism rewards hard work and success. We love the American dream. We can go from rags to riches, the opportunity for upward mobility. Some think that under socialism, people don't work. They become lazy and dependent. Well, are the Nordic countries socialist? By this definition, this def uh, definition of socialism states that uh, a polit it's a political and economic theory of social organization which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. So by this definition, no, the socialist countries are not socialist. However, they do. So by this definition, the Nordic countries are not socialist. Uh, but they do have programs that a lot of us in the US might call socialism. And here are some of them. College and technical training is free or at very low cost. Healthcare coverage, parental leave, sick leave, and vacations, all of these benefits are mandated by law and they are universal. They are not employer-based and not just for certain classes of employees. Regarding vacation, for example, in Denmark, there's 25 days of paid vacation each year and 11 paid holidays. By contrast, in the US, the average is 10 days of vacation after one year, and that's only awarded by some employers. There's an average of eight paid holidays. These benefits are universal. I look at this list of benefits and I think, well, I deserve healthcare, I deserved college. My kids and their spouses deserve parental leave, sick leave, and vacation. Well, if I think I deserve them and my family deserves them, do I think other human beings don't deserve them? 
or do those benefits have to be earned? Let's look at some of the fears we have about socialism. What about freedom? You can see from this slide how the U.S. compares on measures of freedom, transparency, citizenship, participation in democracy, and trust in government. We rank lower than all of the Nordic countries. By voter turnout, Nordic people participate in their democracies at higher rates, and they have more trust in their governments. By the way, Sweden was the first country to guarantee freedom of the press. The Nordic societies and economies are designed to be efficient and practical. Similarly, the Vikings designed their boats to have wide and practical uses. The boats could go across oceans, but they could also navigate rivers. So their boats went to Labrador and Newfoundland, but also to Russia and Baghdad and up rivers in Scotland, England, and France. Very practical. And as an example of practicality, education is viewed as a practical resource that should be optimized. In Norway, George Lakey was having a conversation with a relative about the Norwegian educational system and the costs. That person's response was, aren't brains an economic resource to a country? Why wouldn't you want to develop your resources fully instead of letting a barrier like money get in the way? So the Nordic countries pay for technical school and pay for college. This graph shows that the US educational scores are behind all the Nordic countries but Sweden. Well, does this blend of capitalism and government programs work? Well, here's, a, here's gleaming downtown Helsinki. Do businesses have the freedom needed to prosper and grow? On this graph, it shows that the Nordic countries score higher on the business freedom index compared to the US. And this slide shows that there's actually less governmental control of business in the Nordic countries. So going back to the definition of socialism and state control of the means of production, by this measure, there may be more socialism in the U.S. than in the Nordic countries. There is also some pure majestic beauty. So the governments provide lots of services, but do people still want to work? This slide shows that the employment rate for the U.S. is lower than three of the five Nordic countries. The U.S. gross domestic product per capita is behind three of them. And the countries have succeeded in achieving poverty rates that are less than half the poverty rate in the U.S. Well, how are workers treated there? And this slide shows you some of the benefits that have been brought to us in the U.S. From, uh, by labor unions, and that's true for, uh, throughout the world. So how are workers treated? This graph shows that high, there are higher worker rights in the Nordic countries compared to the U.S. And not surprisingly, unions represent a much higher proportion of workers in the Nordic countries compared to the U.S. And while we saw earlier higher employment rates in most of the Nordic countries compared to the U.S. and often higher GDP production per worker, the workers in the Nordic countries spend far less time working for example, in the U.S., the average is 1,783 hours work per year compared to 1,424 in Norway. That's a difference of 359 hours per year, which leaves almost nine weeks per year for leisure, family time, hobbies, rest, and recuperation. But yes, taxes are higher in the Nordic countries compared to the U.S., and take-home pay is lower. 
In the US, workers get to use their pay to pay for health care premiums and out of pocket health care costs. In the US, people use take home pay to pay for education at you know, primary level, secondary level, college, and they get to fund much of their own retirement pension. And if there's any money left over, they get to save for layoffs, parental leave, and lost work. Practical and efficient. Here's a publicly owned power plant in Copenhagen that uses biofuel to generate electricity with very few emissions. It includes a ski slope. Practical, they build tunnels for ships as well as tunnels complete with roundabouts. So what's the bottom line? Is there a good return on investment? Well, for the last 50 years, the Nordic countries have outperformed US stocks. If you had bought a basket, baskets of stocks from Nordic countries, the investment return was better than US stocks. The, the Nordic nations have arrived at a simple practical formula. Capitalism works better if employees get paid decent wages and are supported by high quality universal benefits. Nordic citizens pay more taxes too, and this might sound like socialism in the US where business leaders and conservative political pundits perpetually warn that taxes will slow growth and reduce incentives to invest in work. In the US, we see and hear endless commercials on how private businesses are doing wonderful things for their employees and their communities. And some of this is true, but much is feel good propaganda. The success of Nordic capitalism is not due to businesses doing more to help communities or their employees. In a way, it's the opposite. Nordic capitalists do less. What Nordic businesses do is focus on business, including good faith negotiations with their unions, while letting citizens vote for politicians who use government to deliver a set of universal public services. Some Nordic capitalists actually do believe in the ideals of you know, equality of opportunity and value of their employees, just like in the United States. But there is also a more selfish reason. Paying taxes is a convenient way for Nordic capitalists to outsource to the government the work of keeping workers healthy and educated. Capitalists in the United States have taken a different path. Here we slash taxes, bemoan government, crush unions, and privatize essential services in the pursuit of what we hope will be more profit for the owners. All of this leaves workers painfully vulnerable to capitalism's disruptions and cyclical flaws. As this shows, capitalism works better if employees get paid decent wages and are supported with high quality universal benefits that enable us to lead healthy and dignified lives with opportunity. Well, are the Nordic people happy? How are they doing? All of the Nordic countries outrank the US for happiness, life satisfaction, quality of life, mother's lives, and raising children. For the third year in a row, Finland ranks, ranks as the happiest country in the world. Where the US ranks high is on the right, in the right column there, the Global Age Watch Index. That's how a country it cares for the elderly. We rank high because of Social Security and Medicare, two socialist programs. Here's a picture of a healthcare facility in Stockholm. And speaking of healthcare, the Nordic countries are, are healthier countries with longer life expectancies and better health systems that spend half the amount per capita of what we spend in the United States. What about opportunity and 
upward mobility, what we call the American dream. This slide shows income mobility across generations. The number of generations it would take for those born in low income families to approach the average income for their society. So what about the American dream, the land of opportunity? Well, for those Americans born in low income families, it takes five generations to get to the mean income levels. You'll see that on to the right of the gold bar there. Uh, this compares to two to three generations for in Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Sweden, all to the very left of the graph. Americans think they have more opportunity for upward mobility, but in fact, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Norway all show greater upward mobility. Greater economic equality supports greater freedom. An April 3rd article in The Nation stated, ordinary Americans are taught to aim for success, yet they are often deprived of education, healthcare, a living wage, affordable housing, job security, and self-respect. They learn to blame themselves for their failure. If you can't get ahead, it's because you don't work hard enough, you don't study hard enough, you don't try hard enough. <sighs> but let's return to George Lakey's book, Viking Economics. In that book, Lakey describes some of the things that happened in the, in the Nordic countries to get where they are. One was they gained a rough agreement on a vision for a new society. They practiced inclusivity. They've used cooperative ownership models to prefigure that vision for their society. And they maintained a commitment to nonviolent struggle. Nordic countries have worked hard to include both urban and rural people, the business and labor people. Uh, across and and they've tried to be inclusive across generations and across across ethnicities democracy works best when people participate we often hear of the homogeneity in the nordic countries and by this measure nordic countries are currently more homogeneous than the us but that is changing. Here's a picture of churches and mosques in the Nordic countries. And this table shows that as a percentage of population, there are more Muslims in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway than the United States. And this slide shows how the percentage of a country's population that is born in another country has changed over several decades. So now there's a higher percentage of foreign born people in Sweden and Norway than in the United States. So the Nordic cultures are changing. I mentioned earlier co-ops. Uh, something else they're doing is emphasizing cooperatives. Uh, cooperatives allow the, the, the workers to retain the wealth uh, and the consumers to retain that wealth. In Sweden, 75% of agricultural output is through co-ops. Housing co-ops account for 18% of housing. Uh, in Norway, co-ops sell 70% of the eggs and 80% of the timber and 76% of the groceries. Uh, more than 2 million Norwegians are co-op members. In Denmark, 97% of the milk is sold through cooperatives. In the U.S., we are proud of how generous we are and how much we give to charities here and around the world. And we should be. We're number two, right behind Myanmar. In terms of foreign development aid, the U.S. is number two, just behind China. But on a per capita basis, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden are all ahead of the United States. 
In the United States, 33% of our foreign aid is military assistance. And as this slide shows, in terms of how much foreign assistance and foreign aid goes to poor countries to help them develop, the Nordic countries all rank higher than the United States. So we come to American capitalism. Can we learn and could we use some changes? Look at the issues that divide us and make people angry. Healthcare, threats to Social Security and Medicare, climate change, fears about the high cost of education and college debt, limited opportunity, low wages, job insecurity, no sick leave or parental leave, living paycheck to paycheck, bloated military spending, wealth and tax breaks all going to the rich, fears of ethnic and religious differences. From an editorial in the New York Times that said, in the US today, well-positioned Americans now struggle under debilitating pressures, poverty, homelessness, medical bankruptcy, addiction and incarceration in incarceration, uh, incarceration can be just a bit of bad luck away. Americans are told that this, that this is freedom and that it is the most heroic way to live. It's the same message Finns were fed a century ago when communists wanted control. It's similar to the message Norwegians and Danes heard from the Nazis during World War II. Maybe it's time we tried some Viking economics here in the US. Thank you. And now I'm going to attempt to answer some of the questions that were presented. Uh, the, a question was, uh, uh, Norway can provide a lot of these services because the country has prospered from all the North Sea oil. Without that oil, would the country be doing so much? Well, oil was discovered in the 1960s, and Norway started uh, enjoying that revenue from the oil in the late 60s and early 70s. But as George Lakey notes in the book, Norway curbed poverty, built a modern infrastructure, and provided good free health care, retirement benefits, and free education before oil was discovered. By the way, with that oil, uh, Norway has created a trust with a trillion dollars in it to serve as a rainy day fund when the oil runs out. Uh, by the way, also, there is a statue of FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in Oslo near the harbor and looking at the Peace Center. Um, there was a question about homog homog homogeneity uh, and that is changing. Uh, I've heard that the countries are, there's a backlash against immigrants. And so will the Nordic countries prohibit immigrants? The short answer to that is no. And there is an example in the book about an immigrant from, to Norway from Burundi. Uh, what they did there, they said to the individual, we will pay you a living wage while you spend a year learning the language, learning the culture. We'll provide you training for a job. We're gonna locate you with the family and it's probably gonna be in a small town and we'll help you find a job. Well, he was the only black man in that rural town in Norway, but he stayed in the country and he's, he's since moved to Oslo and is active in Norwegian society. There's a cooperative insurance company in Sweden that markets specifically to the immigrant population. Sweden ranks number one, Norway number five, Finland number 14 in, the, in accepting asylum seekers. The US is 16. Um, so no, uh, they're not gonna cut off immigration. Uh, in fact, uh, to prepare for this presentation, I did a, an opinion survey of uh, people I know in the Nordic countries. Uh, one question was, do you think there are too many immigrants in your country? No one answered yes. One person answered maybe. And by the way, he's a Muslim immigrant. 
And most of the immigrants to the Nordic countries, by the way, come from other European countries, and, uh, but 30% come from Asia and Africa. Co some of those immigrants come from war-torn Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, and elsewhere. So the best thing we could do is to stop those wars. Other migrants come from counties or countries with less economic opportunity. And the Nordic countries rank very high in foreign development and aid to those countries so they can develop economically. If we stop the wars and we help those countries become stronger, there's going to be less, mi less migration. It's a very practical approach. There is a question about gender equality. And in the book, Lakey acknowledges there's a way to go uh, in, the, in the Nordic countries. Uh, but four of the five Nordic countries have had women uh, prime ministers. Sweden is the exception, but that may change soon. In Finland, the, cap the cabinet is all women. Uh, parental leave is granted to both mothers and fathers. And an average of the par in, in the parliaments of the countries, 40% of the, of the mem parliament, members of parliament are women. Uh, in Norway, at least 40% of, of companies' board members must be women. Um, so and there was another question about these countries are small and they're isolated and they're not subjected to uh, globalism like we are here in the U.S. So, you know, how, could, how can they deal with that? Well, there was an example in Iceland where Iceland much of their economy was dependent upon fisheries and those those prices of fish are entirely global iceland looked at globalization and said that's a race to the bottom if we try to beat them on price so for a tiny economy what they did instead was to say let's look at let we want our economy to serve our values and to serve the people so we want equality and freedom and solidarity so they built they built an economy with free education and they provided people with good housing and they provided good health care and a secure old age pensions they were able to turn that country around to develop a full employment policy and in a country with a population smaller than Omaha, Nebraska, they built their own airline. Another question came up about, uh, you know, how are they dealing financially with the coronavirus? Well, the, one of the things that happened in, in Denmark, the response very quickly was to essentially freeze the economy. And they provided up to 90% of the uh, worker salaries. The government guaranteed up to 90% of the worker salaries. This kept those businesses in place. So those employees don't lose their jobs. They, get, they continue to get a paycheck. It's just being funded and supported through the government. They work with the unions and employers, and the workers will give back five days of vacation. Norway did something uh, similar, but it covers 80% of income after 17 days without an income. And Norway has expanded support for childcare. There have been some other epidemiological issues. Sweden has, a, for example, a higher death rate than the United States right now. And Sweden has a death rate that's 463% four, higher than Norway's. Uh, so the, the epidemiologists are going to have to figure out what Sweden did right, what the other countries did right, and maybe what Sweden did wrong, but perhaps it's also too soon to tell. I mentioned, uh, and, and the, the question came up about uh, um, nonviolent struggle, or, and are there some examples? Well, during World, World War II, when the Danes and Norwegians were attacked by Nazis at demonstrations, they didn't escalate the violence. There are great examples of Danish people not cooperating with the Nazis in, in shipbuilding during, during World War II. There's an example in Sweden when uh, soldiers fired into a, a group of striking uh, workers and killed people. Uh, they didn't react with violence 
and, more, and, and fire back. Instead, they declared a massive general strike. And that strike can transfer the power to the people. And that led to a lot of the big changes in the country. Um, you know, Norway and Denmark and, and Finland were all threatened by Nazis and by communists. And there are great stories of resistance to the, against the Nazis. Uh, and there was a decision clearly in, in Finland to avoid what happened in Russia and to avoid uh, communism there. Another example was in Iceland when there was the banking crisis. Instead of uh, bailing out all the banks, Iceland went, let, let a couple of the banks go bankrupt. And there were massive protests on the part of the people to say, we're going to restructure this so our economy serves the people. Some of those banks went under, uh, but now they're stronger than they ever were uh, before the, uh, the 2007 and 2008 uh, crisis. So those were the questions I received and the answers that I hope uh, uh, are sufficient. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this uh, webinar. Thank you.